I want to turn to the Word of God uh, for a little while. And uh, first of all, of course, uh, the book of Revelation and uh, chapter number 19. Revelation and chapter number 19 and verse 6 says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See, thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And perhaps a few more traditional verses in Ephesians and chapter number 5 and verse 22. Ephesians 5, 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And we do look to God to bless his word to us this afternoon. Uh, for the past three years, I've been working through the book of Revelation and speaking on it on a number of occasions. And by the providence of God, last week I reached uh, chapter 19. It's the only section in the book of Revelation that has anything to do uh, with marriage. And as, as is often the case, as you read the word of God prayerfully, you will find that God will guide you through his word and he'll match the text of scripture to the trials of life, the tests of life, the joys of life, and he'll guide you by it. And so today is the text for today. And I can't think of a, a better text than that than the marriage scene that we have here in Revelation chapter 19. There's one word I want to leave with you apart from that picture uh, of the marriage. It's the word, the big word that we find here in Revelation 19. It's the word omnipotent, omnipotent, the all-powerful God. And that's tremendous, the all-powerful God. You see, the God of the Bible is revealed over 4,000 years as being all-powerful. The Jews have a name for him, El Shaddai, the all-powerful God. And sometimes he's all-powerful because... Well, you see his hand in creation, and you get a glimpse of that. You say, I can understand that the God behind creation must be all-powerful. Certainly, he's all-intelligent, but he must be all-powerful. After all, look at the complexity of life. Surely, that demands uh, a God. Every single one of you, if you were just to spare one of your three trillion cells, just one of them, I'm sure you've got one to spare, and I was to take that, that one cell of your three trillion, and I was to extract all of the text in that little cell, I would have three billion letters, all carefully arranged in the correct order. If one were out of place, uh, then you would have a fatal condition. For example, cystic fibrosis that has been fatal over the years is just the misplaced one letter out of three billion. Three billion letters that would fill books, that would fill this hall. Our God is all powerful. He's in control of creation. And sometimes in this uh, book here, you'll find that God is all-powerful because, as it is said uh, in these verses, he's sovereign, he's upon the throne, the Lord God Almighty reigns, he reigns, he's on the throne. You say, well, I can understand that too. We have an all-powerful God in creation. After all, Albert Einstein said, I, I wrote down his, his quote just in case, you know, I got it wrong, Mr. Einstein. Uh, Everyone who is seriously involved in the pursuit of science, says Mr. Einstein, becomes convinced that a spirit is is manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of man. Uh, the average text, you see, of a novel is 70,000 letters. God's text of one cell is three billion. His intelligence and power is vastly superior. Uh, and then we get a glimpse of his all-powerfulness in the fact that he's sovereign, he reigns. The book of the Bible is about that. The way that God will regain and, uh, control of this universe. Uh, subject to him and punish those that rebel against him and uh, put his son in the place that he ought to be. What an all-powerful God. But that is not the way it's used here. And uh, here's the thought for this afternoon. The all-powerfulness of God is linked to his love. 
The all-powerfulness of God is linked to a marriage scene at the end of the book of Revelation. Because it is as we see God's ultimate purpose in what he's doing fulfilled in this scene, we really glimpse his power. Now you say, is that relevant for what we're doing this afternoon? Yes, it is. Because this is the example that we have to follow. This is the, this is the reason behind marriage. Just as this creation declares the glory of God day after day, just as God has revealed himself in the word of God and revealed himself in Christ, he also reveals himself in the patterns that lie underneath this world and underneath our lives. And one of those patterns is marriage. Because marriage is a picture of what God ultimately is able to do. He's able to bring men and women who are sinners into a living, permanent relationship with him fit for heaven. That's tremendous. And if you were to read through the Bible, you might doubt, you might be skeptical of God's power and God's love. Because at the beginning of the Bible, uh, you'll find that Abraham, Abraham uh, speaks about a coming Messiah. He speaks about a promised one that all the nations of the earth will rejoice in. And Abraham, in a sense, kind of slides into obscurity. And then Isaiah, he speaks about a savior who would come as a lamb led to the slaughter, crucified and bearing our sins. Isaiah speaks about um, a virgin that would conceive and bring forth a son and they call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And do you know what they did with Isaiah? They cut him in half with a wooden sword. You say, God's power is weak. It's not there. The world constantly has its upper hand on him. Surely the world frustrates the purposes of God. And then Zechariah, at the end of the Old Testament, a thousand years before the advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, Zechariah, quoting the God who spoke to him, said something deeply mysterious. God said to Zechariah, they shall look upon me, that's God speaking, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for me, as one mourns for his only son. And you, and you know what they did with Zechariah? Well, they stoned the prophets. You say, God's power is nowhere. The stone, stone the prophets cut Isaiah in, ha in half. David spoke about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus and they hunted him out of his throne. But by the time you come to the end of the book of Revelation, you find that God's power is real. Because after all of those things that have happened, God's ultimate purpose is fulfilled. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage supper or the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. And as you look back through those eons of time, as the prophets spoke and David prophesied and Jesus Christ came into the world, crucified upon a cross, there were those that came to his grave ready to anoint his body because all of their hopes were decimated yet again, just as they had been in the days of Isaiah, Zechariah, and Abraham. They were all gone. The whole Christianity thing was up in the air, and they came to the grave, and in the best attested, uh, perhaps best evidence-based statement of ancient history, the resurrection was there, fulfilled prophecy, testified by eyewitnesses, and of course, testified by the dying apostles. And upon that, you see, we see that God's purposes are never frustrated. Now, is that relevant to what we do this afternoon? Yes, it is. Because this wonderful picture and pattern of God's ultimate purpose in bringing men and women that are sinners into the joy of salvation and forgiveness of sins, this ultimate purpose of God in sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross that ultimate purpose motivated by the love of God, that love God so loved this world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him need not perish but have everlasting life. That ultimate purpose of God is never frustrated. And whilst you might at times you see a look at love and you might think it as a weak thing, maybe you might think of it as a kind of surrendering thing. Maybe you might think that there are other things infinitely more powerful than love. Let me assure you from the word of God that love ultimately does triumph because love is divine. Love is one of the great characteristics of God, one of the five characteristics that John speaks about. Uh, love, God is love. Our God is a God who's an expert at holding things together. He holds the universe together by gravitational forces as Einstein discovered. He uh, holds atoms together by weak magnetic forces. I think Einstein was also involved in that one too. He holds your cells together by intracellular adhesion molecules. Quite a few people involved in that discovery. He's the master of holding things together. And he holds relationships together with love. You'll find that in Colossians 3. Love is never, ever defined in the Bible because it cannot be. It's an attribute of God, but it is described. 
It is the together glue, to paraphrase Colossians 3, it is the together glue of perfectness. It is that glue that holds people together, holds marriages together, it holds relationships together. And that love, when we surrender ourselves to God, is an unbreakable thing. It's a thing that will hold Bex and Sam together. It's a thing that you can depend upon. And at times you might find and you might feel that just giving in to love is weakness, but it's not weakness. It's the way that God holds us to himself. And the way that God holds us to himself through Christ is the way that Sam must hold Bex to himself and Bex must hold Sam to herself. Now, it's not primarily an emotional thing. You can see from earlier on who the emotional one was. Obviously, Sam, wasn't it? Yeah. It's not primarily emotional. Um, it has to do with something even deeper than that, actually. It has to do with choices. And, and that's why, or that's, well, that's one of the, the, the interesting things that come out of Ephesians 5, we were read earlier on. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. There's tremendous cost sometimes in doing that. Uh, there's definitely consistent commitment in doing that, but the consequence is a marriage that endures forever. And if you go down through the passages of the Word of God, you'll find some tremendous marriages that have made tremendous impact upon the world. Maybe that's something for later on. Uh, the challenge that the apostle leaves us, bearing in mind that wonderful picture that God has achieved his ultimate purpose in bringing sinners to himself through love, the love that is demonstrated in the cross of Calvary, that love you and I have to emulate and Sam and Bex must practice in their marriage. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. It is a self-giving love. It said there are four words in Greek for love, and it is said by some of the ancient, uh, or some of the Greek uh, uh, historians that Paul almost invented the word that we find here. It's agape. And the, it, it's a word that, that, it, that draws from the character of God. It goes beyond just ordinary human emotion, eros, or even the, uh, fil the, the filial love of, of uh, ordinary relationships. But this is a love that involves not only the emotion, but the choice. And at times, uh, a sacrifice. A sacrifice so that, well, that, that bond would continue. And we do trust that that love will indeed hold you together as you rest in the love that has its source in the God uh, that you have trusted as your Lord and Saviour. Let's pray. Our Father, we do come into thy presence this afternoon with thanksgiving. We thank thee, our Father, that the supreme example of love is found in the Lord Jesus. We thank thee, our Father, that the love of God is uh, that uh, uh, an immeasurable power that draws us through the work of the Lord Jesus to thyself. We thank thee, our Father, that whilst at times we might wonder at creation and see the immense power of that, the power of the waves and the wind and the, the power of the solar system, yet that all pales into insignificance, into that omnipotent, that all-powerful love that is demonstrated at the cross, a love that gives of its very best, a love that gives of that which is the most dear, a love that gives uh, the only Son. We pray, Father, that for Bex and Sam, that as they go forward into the future, that that love would grow and that that love would be practiced. And we do pray, Father, that their marriage would be truly blessed, uh, not only in the perhaps ordinary human way, but be, be blessed by the presence and power of the Spirit of God using and blessing and holding them uh, close to one another and to Thee. We do offer thanks, our Father, for this time together, and we do commit each one to thee, particularly our Father Samuel and Rebecca. We pray for thy blessing uh, to go with them as we offer thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, so but many... uh, I think the last thing I have to ask is for you to be upstanding whilst the bridal party uh, retires. <laughs> <laughs>